This lecture considers the numerical integration of second order ordinary differential equations. This is commonly done in structural mechanics for transient forced response. You might wonder why do structures people do that instead of working with first order ordinary differential equations as some other fields such as flight mechanics or fluid mechanics do. The answer is that when we already have perhaps 500,000 equations that are second order differential equations, we really don't want to turn that into a million first order differential equations. After all, storage costs run two thirds of the total cost of the process. And just holding that many coefficients in a computer is an expensive process, um, more so even than the actual floating point operations that occur. So structural mechanics people like to deal directly with the second order ordinary differential equations and not reduce those down to first order. I'll start with an overview, mention some of the integration ideas, then we'll soon concentrate on Newmark integration, which is the one that was developed in the civil engineering community by Newmark at Illinois, but has found a lot of application in other mechanical fields. I'll do an example of a small pair of spring suspended masses, and we'll put a transient load on it and show the resultant motion. Then we have about three homework uh, problems that are worked out in the problem session. Numerical integration is sometimes called step-by-step -step integration or marching in time. It's useful for transient forced response of systems and this can also be due to initial conditions that have been put on the body and then start it in motion. The integration can either use physical coordinates or modal coordinates. We're going to use physical coordinates in our examples today, but the uh, integration using modal coordinates is very similar. One difference is that it's a little more difficult to apply initial conditions that are non-homogeneous to the modal coordinates. You have to figure that out and how that's interpreted in terms of the uh, modal uh, coordinates themselves. There are implicit and explicit schemes uh, implicit schemes are a little more sophisticated and a little more work because they require inversion of the mechanical impedance matrix. Explicit schemes only look back in time and are never forced to invert the mechanical impedance. Let me sketch uh, the time history of a typical system to show what happens when you do a numerical integration. Generally, you know the system behavior for a certain set of points, shown here as uh, a system at rest. Then you divide the time axis into these evenly spaced increments, perhaps called delta t in size. Then using the differential equation shown here, plus an approximation for the uh, acceleration and velocity in terms of pass values, we're able to construct a new solution here and then connect our displacement field to that. At some subsequent time we get another solution, perhaps another here and so on. And by so doing, we're able to map out some sort of transient behavior. Let me show a flow chart that uh, maps out some of the kinds of vibration that we might study. Free vibrations would be those uh, used in normal mode calculations. Force vibrations would be those that are governed by external live loads. We'd also consider initial conditions that force the system to be a force type of problem. A steady type of motion can result. This could be due to harmonic loads where the system vibrates harmonically or periodic where you could use a Fourier analysis. Those kinds of problems don't uh, lend themselves well to numerical integration because they are irregular in nature and they can be studied by analytical methods. 
Transient problems are those where there are impulsive forces or uh, strange things happening where the load changes character. These can be solved either by direct integration or by modal methods. The modal area we're not interested in yet, but would have a similar set of uh, subcases under it as are shown here under direct integration. So just consider that the modal methods would have a, a similar set of possibilities. Direct integration will deal with the physical nodal coordinates. The older explicit methods were the ones that have been used for some uh, centuries actually. They're differencing methods. You can use central differencing, back differencing, forward differencing, and there are many tricks of the trade in the explicit solvers. The implicit methods are what we are really interested in today in structures. And the Newmark beta method is probably the leader. I know that Hubolt did a lot of work on uh, stationary random response. Wilson's done a lot of work on earthquakes. And so there are other people who've had other versions of implicit solvers. And they're, they're somewhat closely related, really. They're not that different from each other in philosophy. But we'll study the Newmark one um, at length. Explicit integration methods are favored in many technical fields. This method leads to simpler programming. Um, it can use less computer time in certain situations, such as nonlinear problems, because it avoids inverting the mechanical impedance matrix, which might be changing in time and have to be redone many times in an implicit method. But explicit methods use data from the past and steps in time, and then they project forward to the current time. I've mentioned nonlinear cases. Uh, when I was younger and worked with a professor named Ivor McIver here at Michigan on automobile crashing, we used explicit integration. And it was possible to write rather compact uh, Fortran programs to do that. A problem with explicit methods, though, is that they can become unstable. That is, you can have numerically induced oscillations or even a divergent type of motion. To get proper stability, you have to take many small steps. And then the accuracy of the method is related to that step size. So the common way in explicit methods then is just to take smaller and smaller step sizes until you get the accuracy that you need. This method does give you a filtering action because with a rather large time step, you don't observe the system very often, and therefore you lose high frequency content. That makes this a low pass filter. Examples might include five point integration, which I used earlier in my career on separation of a uh, missile nose cone from the um, basic um, missile body. That was at Bendix Aerospace Systems. And then uh, common central difference methods, which might use, let's say, three points in time, uh, the current time, a future point, and a past point. Now let's equally discuss the implicit methods of numerical integration. Um, these use information from the past time and the equation of motion at the present time. So you couple more tightly the system of equations, thereby requiring that inversion. These are a little tougher to program, therefore. You can make these unconditionally stable regardless of step size. Now that is interesting. You can take really large time steps. Unfortunately, when you do that, you then have a stronger filtering action. Again, you have a low pass behavior. But it happens in a way that is smooth, and it tends to only attenuate the predicted response. You don't get a case where the, the um, calculated response goes berserk and oscillates or diverges. So 
Uh, the penalty for taking really large step sizes is that you smooth out the response and lose the high frequency character. The examples, uh, as before, are Newmark, Wilson, and Hubolt, and we're very interested in the Newmark method. Newmark integration is often called the Newmark beta method uh, because of a parameter beta that's used in the method. It's an implicit method, and it can be made unconditionally stable by adjusting parameters gamma and beta that naturally occur. You can put on both accuracy and stability conditions in determining gamma and beta, and we'll show how that's done. There are three vector equations that are considered in setting up the Newmark beta method. The first is the equation of motion at the current time, shown here. I'll use red symbols for the unknown quantities and assume that these are the ones that are to be found at the current time. We have the equation of motion, which involves n equations in 3n unknowns. But now we need two more relations to get uh, a set of 3n unknowns in 3n equations. One of them is to interpolate velocity as shown here. And uh, in the figure at the right, I've put the unknown quantities as red stars, and those are to be determined by relating those quantities with the previous time step. So we know the acceleration, velocity, and displacement at the previous time step. Let's take the first one here for the velocity interpolation. We take this middle star here and we relate it to the past uh, velocity step, which was here, and that's logical. And then the past acceleration and the current acceleration. So there's a law now that binds these quantities here together. So I'll make this little boomerang shape. There's an interpolation on displacement here, and that relates this unknown displacement at the current time to the past displacement, and then the uh, past velocity and the two accelerations here. So it does not involve the uh, current velocity, interestingly. Now maybe I can make another boomerang shape here like this one. So this one comes like this involving these various quantities. And then, of course, the equation of motion itself involved, at current time, the three quantities. So we have all these uh, relations. Notice that there are some, uh, some terms that don't appear in each of those relations, and that's what allows the equations ultimately to be uncoupled. And I'll show that in our matrix form in the next figure. It was very helpful for me to assemble the full set of equations, the uh, 3n equations and 3n unknowns, just to see the form of the equations. When I reviewed the original paper by Newmark, uh, this was not done, and I really floundered a bit when all of the scalar ideas were treated. It looked just like magic, but when you do this in a matrix form in the full glory of the 3n equations, you begin to see the um, pattern here. Notice that the original equation of motion only has these terms m, b, k on the red variables here on the left, and there are no terms on the past time here on the right. Well, that's exactly what the equation of motion is. It's the relation between those variables at an instant of time, a single instant of time. Now, um, the second equation here um, is the one that was a 
velocity interpolation, and we can see that from the gammas that occurred here. They correlate with the earlier equation that we wrote down. Notice that there's a zero here, and that's what's really important. This zero is what helps us uncouple things. And then the displacement interpolation gave the third equation here, and we know that because the betas are uh, entering here, and that came from the uh, displacement interpolation. Again, we have a nice zero here, and it's these two zeros that help uncouple the equations and allow these um, intricate equations to be handled in somewhat of a scalar form, at least using the uh, submatrices as symbols. Okay, now we will uncouple those equations and solve them as if they were a, a set of three scalar equations. The third equation, the one that contained beta, was the displacement interpolation, and we, in it, we solve for the acceleration at the current time in terms of the displacement at the current time, but notice there was no uh, velocity at the current time and so this basically lets us map from displacements to acceleration so we're going in this direction. The second equation uh, in, in the set was the one on velocity and it had a zero in it as well and we find we can relate the uh, velocities here at the current time to displacements at the current time. And you know what we've done then is we have a way of uh, looking at this other way of inserting every place we see acceleration in the equation of motion, we can put this term on the right. Every place we see a velocity, we can put this term on the right. And we've really reduced the equation of motion to one that involves three n variables down to one that only involves n variables, namely the displacements at the current time. Let's now see how the equation of motion does change. Um, here it is in its original glory, and now that we know how to write both u dot and u double dot in terms of u itself, we can just make that substitution. You get all of these terms shown below, and this is an equation that holds at the present time, and it only involves the n variables in the displacement at the present time. So this is n equations and n unknowns and can be solved. The solution is simplified a bit if we define a mechanical impedance term, a little bit like the complex mechanical impedance in the frequency response case, except here this is a real quantity and it does involve the frequency more in terms of the period of the time step and the period squared. So we'll use this as this new kind of stiffness. It's the uh, K um, carrot here, and when that's put on the left side over here, you have the equation that looks a bit like a linear static problem. In fact, that's the way it's solved, and these quantities from past times on the right side appear like pseudo loads in the problem. So it's a past history now that's catching up and uh, adding in to the current live loads, so all this adds with the live load here and gives you the equivalent of a static problem. The coefficients can be found and it takes about, oh, maybe half an hour to run through all of these equations and you find these different A values uh, as shown below. Notice that those are the um, uh, they have different dimensions. Some of them have delta times squared, um, others delta times, some are just constants. What you're seeing here now is the power of the mass or the inertia effect when you have terms divided by delta t squared. 
so that at very small times this inertia term here becomes relatively more important than the velocity or the stiffness. This really reminds me of a uh, case when I was younger. My older brother Albert and I used to read Hugo Gernsback's Science Fiction Plus. And it was a great uh, sci-fi magazine of the uh, late 40s, early 50s. And uh, I still remember the story about the mad scientist who drank this potion that sped time up for him. And uh, boy, one, one uh, snort of that stuff and he zoomed around uh, like crazy. So the problem was when he was under the influence of that, he found that normally uh, pliable objects became very rigid because as he ran into them, they resisted greatly. In fact, uh, people became like marble statues. And, and we realized then at that time that yes, that would happen if you worked on such a fast time scale flitting around, then the uh, inertia of bodies would, would not allow you to, to move them quickly. In one experiment this mad scientist did, he uh, found a person standing in a room and he came up and pushed on that person. Uh, and nothing happened, of course, for a period of time and he held the force on. Then he left the room and, and zoomed around to other parts of the world. But when he came back, he found that person crashed into the wall. In other words, he put enough uh, momentum into that, or enough impulse into that system, which was a standing human being, to cause a momentum that threw the person violently across the room. And I can imagine the person's uh, uh, chagrin at this suddenly being from, from one spot in the middle of the room and then thrown violently to the other side by some unseen hand. The scientist finally got his comeuppance when he was out on a boat on the uh, water and it was a stormy day and he saw lightning bolts come around and didn't think much about it until one came after him and he saw it coming and he jumped out of the boat and of course he just ran on the water because the water was so hard to displace it was like solid and that was his undoing because he couldn't even get under the water he couldn't avoid the lightning bolt and it went zig and zag and uh, zorched him uh, right in the seat of the pants and that was at the end of the crazy scientist but I still did get quite an appreciation what happens if your time scale is such that time is sped up and that's equivalent to these really incredibly small delta t's that are often used. We have a solution now for displacements at the current time step and we need to recover the velocity and acceleration information. At first glance, you'd say, oh, just take a derivative and that'll give you the velocities and accelerations. But wait a minute, you don't do derivatives in the analytical sense when you're doing numerical integration like this. Rather, you do it by differencing. And really, that's what we've been doing all along, is setting up relations at different time steps to try to figure from that what really the velocities and accelerations need to be. Now, as we were uncoupling the equations, we developed two equations that were uh, to help us eliminate velocity and acceleration separately. And now we just return to those, uh, putting in the values of these newfound A coefficients as a help. So we can now recover uh, the, both the acceleration and the velocity uh, easily. We have a useful integrating formula in our hands that has two arbitrary coefficients, gamma and beta. We might wonder what range of values could gamma and beta take logically. Well, they originally popped up in the interpolating formulas for displacement and velocity. And if you look carefully at that, you see they were a weighting factor that tells how much to emphasize the current acceleration versus the past acceleration. Um, you would think, therefore, these might be numbers somewhere between 0 and 1. I mean, they're not going to be a million or, or plus a million or minus a million. But let's go into a study on gamma and beta and see what they really should be. We'll consider both accuracy and stability in our discussion. And we'll preview the results um, so that you have some feeling. Newmark showed that gamma of one half is the only reasonable value. And when you do that, you get um, very good 
accuracy and you do not get the effect of an artificial damping. If you choose another value of gamma, you get something like artificial damping. In structural mechanics, we don't want that. Interestingly, in fluid mechanics, they often do like it because it cuts down on some oscillations when you have flow through shock waves and things like that. But for us, we don't want any artificial damping, thank you. Then beta is actually chosen as a compromise to give both accuracy and stability. It's not the most accurate one, nor is it the most stable that you could choose. And when you take New marks two values of one half and one quarter, then you get what's called the Newmark beta method. I want to take you through his original arguments by using these defining equations, um, as Hamming has called them, and we'll see this uh, develop. Our defining equations are an attempt to cause zero error in certain simple polynomial integrations. We will do it um, as we have done in some other situations where we consider successive polynomial terms in one of the variables, namely in the acceleration. I don't want to work with vector quantities here, so I'm going to consider a system with only one degree of freedom, in other words, a scalar equation. Such a case could be this uh, constant acceleration case of a ball falling in a constant gravitational attraction. So in other words, the acceleration is unity, and we'll assume a uh, unit acceleration, I guess a unit um, gravity and a unit mass for this body. Uh, that falling ball then would lead to a velocity that would be linear in time and a displacement field that would be parabolic. And we'd like to be able to integrate this situation exactly. If you ask where the error has crept into our formulation, it has to be in those interpolating formulas that we used. The equation of motion at the current time was exact, and then we artificially introduced an approximate interpolation for velocity and displacement. So why don't we look at those two equations and then ask that they not be approximate, but that they be exact for some simple uh, forms of uh, integration. So the velocity interpolation formula is shown here. The current velocity depends on the past one, plus this weighted average of the uh, past acceleration and the current acceleration. And you can see gamma here could logically take values uh, from, uh, let's see, from 0 to 1 would make sense. For the given problem, though, of the falling uh, point mass, uh, we know what the analytical expression should be, that the current uh, velocity should be this, and uh, we can calculate then from the uh, various terms above the pass velocity and then these interpolated values here of acceleration. Now, since the, both the past and the current accelerations are unity, things simplify, and when you put the terms in, you get that zero equals zero. In other words, we identify, identically satisfy the interpolation formula for all gamma when you have a constant acceleration of unity. To some extent, we've just locked out. We found that whoever set up that gamma parameter did it in a way uh, that it doesn't affect the accuracy of a very simple integration case. Now, um, let's check the uh, choice of beta and see how it affects the interpolation on displacement. Here was the general formula. And then when we take our specific case of unit acceleration that led to an analytical expression for the uh, current displacement, and here was the analytical expression for the previous displacement, then we have to look at the acceleration fields. Now these up here 
are again just unity in our test problem and those are put in here and here. When you gather all the terms and turn the crank and simplify, again we get zero equals zero. So we have really lucked out and we again have a very accurate answer even for any choice of beta. I think you could see here though, in this case, beta might take values from perhaps zero to one half. Uh, would be logical physically. And that would be a way to wait between the uh, current and past accelerations. We're now in the position of a, a boy who has two coins in his pocket uh, and those are our parameters, uh, gamma and beta, and he has those to spend. And he goes to the candy store and he says, I'm gonna start out with the simplest, you know, the, my old favorite candies. And he asks for the first two pieces of candy and the shopkeeper says, those two are free. You have those and you don't have to spend any coins. Wow, what luck. Uh, so we're in that same position. But now let's try for something fancier. Let's see uh, about an acceleration that is presumed to be linear. And of course that can be analytically integrated easily. What would be a physical example of this? Well, if you had a rocket that was of constant weight and wasn't burning off uh, propellant, that sounds a little tricky, uh, but its thrust went up like T or gain linear in time, linearly in time, then that would be such a typical case. So uh, the force acting on the system is gonna cause for a constant mass, a linear acceleration as shown here. And then the question is, how do our interpolating polynomials fare in this situation? I just heard myself calling the interpolating formulas interpolating polynomials. Well, it's strictly speaking true, but let's call them formulas. So here's our velocity interpolation formula. When we assume linear acceleration, we know how to integrate and get the uh, velocity field here, the current one and the past velocity field. The accelerations have been directly chosen to be linear in time, so the old one is T0, the new one is T1. And then we just equate terms here. Now T1 and T0 are arbitrary. Uh, if possible, we'd like these three bracketed quantities to be independently zero so that um, we can have this expression true for any starting time and any finishing time in our uh, time step. Luckily, that works out. If you look at each one of those, gamma equals one half satisfies each one, which is more than you could really hope for. So gamma of one half gives you an exact velocity interpolation. Our fourth and last defining equation has to do with interpolating displacements. Again, we assume that the acceleration field varies as t. It's a linear acceleration field. With that, we can integrate and get the current displacement and then the displacement at the previous time step at t0. We put in the, uh, this is the past acceleration and here is the present acceleration. Gather terms and we again find that we have a series of independent bracketed terms here. We'd like all of those to go to zero and our luck seems to hold out that beta of one six satisfies all of those and causes zero error. So if we wanted to emphasize accuracy, and we haven't yet talked about stability, unfortunately, then we would choose beta equals one sixth, and that is called the linear acceleration method. So for, a, for an accurate method, that would be the optimum without considering stability. Well, at this time, we still feel pretty lucky. We're like the boy with the two coins in his pocket, and we really got four pieces of candy for the price of two. Unfortunately, we haven't yet looked at stability, and it's a more advanced topic, but I can summarize the results. We've just finished doing what is really the linear acceleration method. That was known before Newmark's time, and, and of course, he was well aware of it. 
But he did extensive studies of stability of small uh, spring mass systems and did integration and, and looked at what happened and argued correctly that if he could pick beta equal to one quarter, that then the method would be stable. And furthermore, it's been shown since then that that's unconditionally stable. In fact, if you pick gamma to be greater than or equal to one half and beta equal to this quantity, and you look at that, you see that the Newmark beta method is right on the boundary. It's the most accurate method that still is unconditionally stable. And so, so that uh, Newmark hit the nail right on the head and picked the very best set of coefficients. I have to give him a lot of credit for working out the stability study. The people who did this more general set of laws were using more powerful mathematics and from general argument, but came along later. So Newmark is rightfully known for having done a really good job on the Newmark beta method. We finished with the derivation of the Newmark beta method. Now let's compare some implicit integration schemes. We're going to look at the Hubolt method, the Wilson theta method with theta equal to 1.4, and the Newmark beta method. The test case we'll use is a spring mass system, and we'll numerically integrate what ought to be a harmonic oscillation. The error can show up in several ways. One is that you can have amplitude decay even though there's no real damping in the system. That would be a measure of error. It's shown in this little sketch embedded in the figure. So the amplitude decay might be uh, related to the fractional decay over one cycle of the amplitude of the body. Then the second thing would be period elongation. If there are artificial viscous effects in this, you might slow the system down to where instead of getting the proper period tau, you might get uh, a small amount more, and that's called period elongation. The first figure